Well, Spencer, thank you so much for, for joining. Are you coming in from Los Angeles today? I am. I'm in LA today. Thanks, Brandon. And I have to tell your viewers, today is your birthday. So happy birthday. <laughs> um, and, uh, and thanks for recording this episode with me on your birthday. It's nice so, to yes, spend my birthday I'm in LA. <laughs> <laughs> um, would you mind just giving everyone your background, just kind of sure. your career arc uh, leading up to .LA? Absolutely. So, um, I uh, went to Harvard undergrad and like many people coming out of Ivy League schools without any clear training um, on anything in particular, I went into investment banking because um, that's kind of what you do when you graduate from uh, the, an Ivy League school and don't know what else to do. I, so I did the same. <laughs> <laughs> you can relate. Yeah. So I did two years at Goldman Sachs uh, in investment banking and it was a great experience, very foundational. You know, I definitely recommend something like that at the beginning of one's career but it wasn't for me uh, long term. And I left New York, moved to San Francisco to work in private equity. I worked at a firm called TPG, and did private equity investing. Um, again, great experience, foundational, but also private equity investing wasn't for me. And in particular, I found it um, not to be entrepreneurial enough and not to be uh, operational enough. It was a lot, um, you know, I just, I can't get that excited about looking at a balance sheet. Um, and there are some people that can, and that's God bless. The world needs people that get all jazzed up about thinking about structuring and finance and debt and balance sheets and whatever. And I'm more of an income statement and the, and thinking about the people that create the products that gen, that drive the income statement kind right. of, kind of person. So anyway, uh, left private equity in 99 to start, a, to do a startup called Hotwire which um, we started in 1999 and uh, went through ups and downs and we could talk a lot about it if, if, if you want, but ultimately we sold the company four years later in 2003 to Expedia, which was based in Seattle. And so I left San Francisco, moved to Seattle to work at Expedia, our new parent company. And I lasted about a year at Expedia before I wanted to do something more entrepreneurial again. And so I left Expedia to start Zillow and that was in 2006. And um, we went public in 2011 and you know, the company grew from an idea to, by the time I left about a year ago, we had about 4,000 employees and a three, billion, three or four billion of revenue, 10 to 15 billion market cap. So it had become a really big company moving outside of its original space, which was just home valuations and home listings into rentals and mortgages and buying and selling homes. And then, um, uh, when I left Zillow, I, I moved back to Los Angeles where I grew up and now I'm happily living in LA and I've got a bunch of different projects underway, startup investing and, um, and, um, and some other late stage projects. But one of the things that I'm doing is I started a company called Dot LA, which I'm grateful that you invested in. And Dot LA is a media site to cover LA tech. And just briefly on, on that, I'll say, um, you know, we'll probably discuss it more, but LA has a burgeoning, a very vibrant tech scene. It has incubators and accelerators and early stage investors and angel investors and, and mid-stage, late stage, private equity, hedge fund, founders, um, you know, unicorns, uh, big public company. It has everything except it didn't have journalism. It had, nobody was telling the story of the region. And I found that very odd uh, because in Seattle, where Zillow was, there was a website called GeekWire which does a great job of covering the Seattle tech community. And the Bay Area has TechCrunch. And you know, even New York has Business Insider that focuses on the New York tech community. And LA just had nobody telling the story of all this innovation that was happening. And so we started .LA to, to shine a light on all the great startups and innovation that are happening in the LA tech community. And I'm just curious, like, do you have any like, working theses as to why? Like, why was it that LA had emerged as like, this real tech hub but there was the absence of any, you know, uh, yeah, I have a lot of specific journalism. So, so um, I'll separate that to like, why did it? Why has it become a, a, a thing? Why is yeah. LA Tech happening? To why was there no journalism? Uh, in terms of why there was no journalism, I think there are two reasons. Number one, it's very difficult to find a business model in journalism, um, and so uh, and you know, dot LA, which even though in the we're only a, seven months since we launched, we're the most widely read uh, news service covering LA Tech. 
but we still lose money. Um, you know, we're starting to sell ads and sponsorships and have, have some, some different business model ideas, but it's difficult to make money in, in media. And so you just don't see a lot of startups, um, you know, in, in the space. Um, but, but secondly, there's something interesting about LA that, um, it, it doesn't, there's, there's a lot of quiet boosterism in LA, but it doesn't have the, the sort of uh, chip on its shoulder that Seattle has. You know, mm -hmm. Seattle is constantly saying like, look at us, look at us. We're as good as the Bay Area. We're, you know, we have a lot going on. We have tech. I, I have found that in LA, people, um, it, people here are like, whatever, we're just kind of doing our thing. And like, you know, we know LA is awesome, but we don't have to shout it from the rafters. So there wasn't kind of this like sense of this homegrown need to, to chest thump the way there, there is in Seattle. And so nobody had, um, and nobody had kind of filled that gap, except for upfront. You know, Mark Sister has been like a one-man band, you know, kind of clapping kind of on his own for a long time, saying, you know, long LA, long LA. And, um, you know, now now he has a, he's starting to have a whole chorus behind him. And, and now Dot LA is kind of in the orchestra pit and is starting, you know, is starting to become a crescendo. Um, yeah. And, and by the way, when you, when you approached me, I remember with the idea, um, that, that was exactly my thought. It just actually never occurred to me. As you know, I started Fitball <laughs> in 2017, and it, a lot of the venture funds up in Northern California didn't know we existed. And right. there was this like weird bifurcation of like the two media ecosystems. But maybe backing up a bit, um, you know, this phrase like LA is having a moment, Silicon Beach, you know, all these yeah. kind of words are thrown around. But like, why is LA tech? Booming. Yeah. So a bunch of reasons. Um, first of all, um, LA is where the, the world's tastemakers live, you know, in pop culture, in sports, um, in film, like this is where the people that tell the people in Kansas and Europe and China what's cool, like they live in LA. And um, a lot more of tech is becoming consumerized. And so the fact that LA is this kind of the beating heart of and the intersection of pop culture and media and entertainment is all in Los Angeles, I think, plays to its strengths, whereas the Bay Area's historical strength has been technical talent and engineering talent and, um, and not really the storytelling and the kind of marketing piece that, that's been imported from New York and L.A. up to the Bay Area, um, which, which takes me to the second thing that I think L.A. has benefited from, which is it is a lot easier and cheaper and less technically complex to start a company today than at five or 10 years ago. So just to give you some data points, for example, um, uh, an LA startup, Behold, which I'm an investor in, launched this week, um, run by a friend of mine, former Nordstrom exec. You know, it's an e-commerce site. It's sort of like a Stitch Fix type, uh, type product. And you know, they have fewer than 20 employees, probably fewer than five engineers, because they're able to use you know, Google Analytics and Shopify and Stripe and Twilio and Slack and Asana and Trello and like all these services that didn't exist five or 10 or 15 years ago. Compare that with when we launched Zillow in 2011, sorry, 2006, we had about 200 employees and probably about 100 of them were engineers at the time of launch. Mm -hmm. And in 1999, when we launched Hotwire in San Francisco, we had about 200 employees and probably 150 of them were engineers. I mean, you would never need to hire 150 engineers nowadays to launch a new, a new website, a new service. And so anyway, because of all those um, services, plus the growth of distributed engineering in, in other countries that can now do... Um, do work for, for US startups. You can do a startup in LA with five engineers, 10 engineers, you know, three designers. Um, you don't have to be in the Bay Area where there's a larger pool of, of technical talent because you can start companies on, on, um, with, less, with fewer resources today. So that's a big advantage to LA. And do you think there's, there's something also just about the, you use the word intersection, this intersection of kind of media and influence and, and tech. That, that's obviously very real and I think LA um, that's a huge driver of the tech ecosystem. But I think about it, you know, even with respect to our business, like technology used to be almost conceptualized as like a, se a sector unto itself, right? There was yeah. real estate, there was energy, there was transportation, there was tech. And then tech was no longer satisfied with being its own thing and it started to bleed and collide with all these other old world industries. And in our space, right, this collision of real estate and tech that, you know, Zillow was a, a, a big part of, I mean, that's happening everywhere. That's not happening in San Francisco. And I would say from our perspective, there's actually value in being outside of San Francisco insofar as 
you're not as subject to the kind of echo chamber, right? Of building totally. tech for tech, for tech people um, that like tech things. And that can be very self-fulfilling, but at the same time impractical. And we've noticed this with real estate tech. It's not that San Francisco is losing to any one city. It feels like San Francisco and the Bay Area is kind of losing to the field. Yep, um, I totally well, agree. I, I totally agree. I mean, um, uh, it's, um, uh, you know, where to, where to begin? I, I, I couldn't agree more. Um, I, I guess I'd say um, that uh, things are getting more distributed. Yeah. Um, you know, there's a venture fund called Rise of the Rest, for example, that I'm an LP in, which I think, you know, is all about that investment thesis, right? It's all about the fact that there are great startups in Lincoln, Nebraska, and in Montreal, and in you know, Miami, and places that are not venture capital hubs that um, are able to create great companies nowadays, and that wasn't the case five or 10 years ago. Um, and there are a lot of reasons for it. Um, and I mean, you know, certainly the, there are lifestyle reasons for it that are working against the Bay Area relative to other parts of the country. Um, but but that's that's more of a like it's that, a very it's more of a mystic way of saying it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean it's yeah. So it's I mean uh, San Francisco is um, is is very challenged. Now a lot of a lot of cities are challenged. Seattle's challenged. Right. LA's challenged. They both have homeless people. You know homeless populations, large large homeless populations, income inequality, traffic, like a lot of these same issues. Um, San Francisco does seem to be uh, a little bit worse. It reminds me more of. Um, you know, I lived in New York when I was a kid from seven, 1975 to 1985 and New York back then was, was like, uh, kind of like Gotham in a Batman movie. It was like dark I, and I scary. Up, and I didn't know this about you, but I grew up in New York in the eighties. That's why I got the, I, I, love yeah, I noticed that bug. No, I mean, I, I remember being a kid in New York and, you know, I'd be standing at a, uh, you know, stoplight and my mom, like, you know, worried about like people next to us and kind of holding me tight and. You know, that's where the, the, the neuroses come from um, <laughs> of, of, you know, she would tell a story how like she was pushing me in a baby stroller one time and somebody like ashed a cigarette into the, you know, into the, uh, into the stroller, like onto me. And like, who knows if that actually happened or not, or if it's apocryphal, but, but like, you know, that, <laughs> that, that, that goes that's deep in, in people that grew up in New York. But so, so, so definitely there's, there's some of that going around in, in other cities, including the Bay Area, but I don't, it's not quite so zero sum, I'd say. Yeah. Um, you know, it's more that you can now build a great company in LA uh, or, or elsewhere, and it didn't used to be that way. Um, yeah. I, I just got off the call with um, a founder of a 3D printing company in Montreal, um, startup that's raised uh, four million of seed and is looking to is about to close a 20 million Series A, and they're trying to decide: do we go to San Francisco, New York, or LA uh, as our kind of U.S. headquarters and probably full headquarters of the company? They're based in Montreal right now. And, um, and he's likely to choose LA, he said, based on all, all this, the things that we're talking about, that, um, you know, lifestyle reasons, recruiting, um, in, there's pl there are plenty of great uh, people here, especially in aerospace and, and um, uh, manufacturing. Um, there are enough software engineers in, here in LA. Um, the employee retention is a little stronger because there's not quite as mercenary a culture. You know, there's, there's very much a mercenary culture in, in the Bay Area where people go and stay for a year or two, get, get over that first cliff festing, and then they move to the next startup and the next startup. Seattle and LA don't have that, um, that culture as much. And so I think it's a little bit easier place to retain great employees than the Bay Area. So there are a lot of good advantages. And what's interesting is what you're describing, this kind of um, this, this shift in where you know, technology knowledge workers are choosing to start their businesses. This collides with you know, the pandemic and the implications of the pandemic, right? I mean, you open the news every day and it's like this company is deciding to work remotely or virtualize, you know, their employee base indefinitely. Um, and so how do you think that intersects with this trend that was already afoot of the Bay Area kind of not being the Venice, you know, Venice, Italy, uh, yeah. <laughs> or the Florence, right, of tech? Um, what do you think the future holds? Do you think that the the hubs become stronger, the hubs become more diffuse, or do you think it's like truly the field in the sense that like Boise, Idaho will have as many, you know, new companies being founded out of it as a major city that is today considered a tech hub? I think you're going to end up with, you know, 
10 tech hubs um, and, you know, kind of NFL cities or, or kind of the biggest NFL cities um, are all going to be very, have very vibrant tech scenes. Actually, to your point a, a moment ago, there's no such thing as like tech anymore, right? I mean, there are more software engineers at Citigroup or Goldman Sachs, you know, than 99% of pure tech companies. So what does it even mean to be a tech company when, you know, you've got financial service companies or healthcare companies are probably more software engineers at, you know, Blue Cross than at most tech companies. So, um, so tech is everywhere now. Yeah. Um, but, but what I think is going to happen uh, is, uh, obvi- is basically this hybrid flex model is going to become normal. Sort of what, what open office space in the 90s and 2000s was to closed individual offices in the 70s, 80s, and 90s. Um, I think a hybrid work model is going to be to, to open office space. In other words, I think most companies are going to have a, a system where um, employees will be asked to show up, um, you know, one day every other week based on their team. So, uh, you know, imagine a, a 500 employee tech company, for example, or maybe non-tech company, you know, the 15 people working on this project should come in, you know, next Wednesday because we're going to do in-person one-on-ones. We're going to do a brainstorming and a, you know, a hack week demo thing, and then have a happy hour afterwards. And so put on your schedule, everybody, that next Wednesday is when this team needs to be in the office. Everyone else, you're always welcome to come in wherever you want. Um, when you come in, you'll punch your, your badge and it'll tell you which desk to go to. So it'll be a hoteling type system. Uh, I think the footprint will be radically reduced. It'll be probably two to three full-time employees per desk because you'll only have you know a quarter of people in the office at any point in time there'll be a lot more conference room space and on the all hands days you know the one day a month when everybody's expected in the office the place will be overflowing because they won't have enough desks for that but you know it'll be fine who cares people will sit on the floor conference rooms or you know whatever it'll work itself out um and um and so for for commercial real estate that means much much lower footprints um uh, it also means that every meeting will have good tel- good video conferencing because there'll be a couple people remote at home, you know, or in some other city. Um, and I think it also means that um, from, from a residential real estate standpoint, it means that there'll be much more urban sprawl. And we're already seeing this with COVID where, you know, if you only have to go into your office in San Francisco one day every week or one day every three weeks, you can live in Napa, you know, you can live in Sacramento, you can live in, you know, wherever in, in Calistoga and drive an hour or an hour and a half. You, you know, you don't have to live in LA. You don't have to pay through the nose to live in Santa Monica. You can live in, you know, Santa Barbara or Ojai or, you know, Laguna or whatever. You can live an hour to an hour and a half away because you're only making that commute once a week, once every other week. And by the way, once autonomous vehicles really come, there'll be another step change in that sprawl. Because if right. I can have my car drive me from Santa Barbara one day a week into LA, then it doesn't bother me really that it's a two hour drive. Who cares? I'm in the back seat while the car's driving itself. And you know, maybe that's 10 years away or 20 years away, but it's coming at some point. Um, so there'll be much more sprawl and um, the main, the, the, the really high prices in the main cities like in San Francisco and LA will, will start to come down. Um, I'm pretty skeptical of the, you know, like the, like I'm picking up stakes and moving to Boulder, you know, from, from LA or I'm moving to Idaho or I'm moving permanently to park city or whatever. I mean, there are some people, some knowledge workers kind of at the very top that are that location flexible, but I think most people are going to need to be able to get into a physical office, you know, once a week, once a, once every two, three weeks, and they're going to want to have their kids in, in schools kind of in the city that, that they feel connected to. So there's a lot of um, media attention to those stories of like people picking up and moving to, you know, yeah. some in the middle, the middle of nowhere. But I think that's overblown uh, in the media. And it, but the sprawl is is not. Yeah, I think that it's it's more. I feel like cities are are in competition with one another. And you think about the, you know, the dichotomy between Los Angeles and San Francisco. Like when I made the decision personally, um, it was a quality of life decision, right? If I took, if you take, uh, say, cost of living and quality of life, um, San Francisco is a little off, right? Because it's kind of the cost of New York with not the same quality of life or the same kind of cultural vibrancy. And Los Angeles was more attractive. So in that sense, Los Angeles and San Francisco were in competition for me as the, as the executive that was making the decision around location. 
But what's interesting is that even if we move to the hybrid model that, that you're describing, it feels a bit like cities start to be in competition with one another around knowledge workers, because to the extent you can work virtually, you know, it, it's not just about convincing the CEOs, it's about convincing that middle layer of managers and knowledge workers that can do their job remotely where they should be. And so I think about the analogy of like, you know, bring your own device to work, which was a thing, right? When, when we went from everyone has to use BlackBerry to now you can use Android or iPhone or BlackBerry, whatever you want, you just bring it to work and it works. It's kind of like bring your own location to work. And do you think that cities start to more aggressively court knowledge workers? Meaning, do you think that in the next 10 years or so, we'll see cities like, a, say, a Salt Lake or uh, Oklahoma City or Austin launch pretty aggressive campaigns to say, if you're working remotely, the schools they should. are better here, the taxes they are should. lower. Here. I don't know if they will. I don't know if they will because they got other, you know, it's, it's, they should. Politically speaking, that's not a great position for a local politician to take because it bring, you know, it's perceived to bring gentrification right. and increased home prices and traffic and all sorts of stuff. But it, it's, they ought to, um, <laughs> you know, I mean, absolutely. Bellingham, which is a cute little town, you know, an hour and a half north of Seattle and has a university and, you know, they absolutely should be doing this to try to steal people from, you know, from LA. It's kind of the, you know, it's what Montecito should be doing from, you know, to, sorry, to steal people from Seattle and Montecito should be doing to steal people from LA and, and Napa Valley should be doing to steal people from San Francisco. But I don't know if they'll, if they'll necessarily do it. Um, because of the political, um, you know, political reasons against it. But, um, but yeah, they ought to. <laughs> yeah, and it, it seems like it, it's a little bit industry dependent too, right? Like there's, you take a city like Los Angeles where entertainment is a big driver, obviously of employment and the tax base and housing, and you can't replace a movie set, right? <laughs> Definitionally, the people have to be in the same location to film the scene. Um, and I think what it feels like from CEOs I've spoken to they still care about having an office, but what that what the purpose of that office is means something different. It's no longer a place where you put your computer and you know don't don't talk to anyone all day and just type on your your computer. That right. you can do from home, right? And they don't need to pay for that rent. It's about a cultural development place around building company culture and mentorship and um, coordination between teams. And so, do you think that um, that will have a long term impact on commercial real estate? Like meaning, do you think that as maybe office footprints shrink, don't disappear, but as they shrink for big companies, do you think landlords are going to be kind of in the business of like trying to advertise why their space is the best for building culture? Or it's the most flexible, well, most adaptable. Yeah, I mean, you remember when WeWork was, was flying high, that's what a lot of institutional landlords were starting yeah. to, to, to focus on, right? You know, the, 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 the culture as a service that WeWork revolutionized was um was something that others were were trying to replicate um so so yeah i mean there, it's it's like the covid is accelerating every trend that we had seen for the prior 15 years just got accelerated by like at least five years whether it was e-commerce penetration um you know uh food delivery through mobile apps um uh, you know, owning less ownership of cars, like, uh, you know, whatever, like uh, more streaming, uh, you know, fragmentation of streaming services and home, you know, consumption of home entertainment instead of out of home entertainment, like every one of these trends, like huge acceleration and work from home, a huge yeah. acceleration and companies, um, you know, reducing their square foot per, per full-time employee. Um, uh, you know, I, I think, you're, I th there will be some some variance though, um, like about how companies approach this. So, like you know, Reed Hastings, for example, on Netflix gave a pretty controversial perspective on this the other day, where he said, "I think you know, all work from home. I can't see anything positive from work from home." Was what mm -hmm. he came out and said. And he's like, "I hope that we return to offices as soon as possible." And um, you know, I think companies at most will end up with four days in the office and one day remote. That's at least where I want Netflix to return to. And, I, and just today, JP Morgan announced that on September 19th, like soon, probably by the time this airs, perhaps all JP Morgan traders and bankers and employees have to be back at their desks um, in New York. So, so there are going to be some companies kind of at that end of the spectrum. <laughs> and then there are going to be others at the like Twitter end of the spectrum who are like, 
you know, work from wherever you want. Like we don't care. Yeah. And, and employees are going to self select a little bit for, for those different types of cultures. It's going to be another thing that, that they can, that these companies compete on for, for culture and retention and employee engagement. Personally, I'm more towards the kind of Twitter side of things, which is the more um, uh, flexible about being remote, which is, which is really weird for me because I was um, pre COVID. I was so much in the, in the camp of no work from home. I remember when Marissa Mayer took over Yahoo. Do you remember when, you know, she famously said no more work from home. And um, that was not that long ago. It was like five, six, seven years ago. And at the time it was a very unpopular thing because there were thousands of Yahoo employees that were working from home at the time. And um, I was very, you know, secretly quietly thinking like, good for her. Cause like she's getting people back in the office where they can collaborate and that, you know, work from home is nonsense. People just, you know, they watch TV during the day and they're, you know, and, but most of tech was pretty angry at her for, for saying, no, you got to come into the office. Anyway, so my, my perspective has totally changed to be much more uh, open-minded about work from home. And if I, I'm not CEO of a company, you know, right now I'm on a couple of boards, the companies that I'm involved in, if I were CEO of a company, I would be pushing this hybrid approach where I yeah. um, am comfortable with work from home, but expect some in-office presence, you know, with some periodicity based on, um, based on events in, in the company's uh, cycle. I will give you one other winner here. I think there's another winner, which is going to be um, employee productivity software and HR tech. And um, that's you know, what I was about like, to say is like, it's almost like if this had happened seven years ago, right? When Marissa made that comment, it probably was more true then than it is today because right. we both weren't using Zoom then. This meeting right. wouldn't have been so easy to schedule and it could be so just totally. assume that you're going to log in and we're both going to log in and we can hear each other. Like, just yeah. basic stuff around telepresence wasn't up to snuff seven years ago. Or, or, or Slack or whatever Slack, other, yeah. you know, coordination tools you're using. But, um, but, but I mean, the, there, there are two pieces to this. There's the collaboration software like Zoom and Slack and Asana and Trello. Um, and then there's also like HR tech. So software that helps management um, keep employees engaged, assess employees engagement, you know, everything from employee onboarding to training, learning and development, um, measurement um, uh, of productivity and, and um, health and wellness. Like there's, there are a lot of startups in that space. I have a couple personal investments in them and I'm really interested in that. I think a company that, let's say a company has a hundred million dollars a year of annual rent expense and maybe, and if I'm right, they take 25 or 50 million out of that um, rent expense in two or three years when their leases come up. Um, I would be looking to spend, you know, 5 million a year out of say 25 to 50 of rent savings. So take a, a, a not insignificant portion of that and put it into software mm -hmm. to build esprit de corps remotely. You know, what, what, what is that? How do we replace the, the, the ping pong table, yeah. <laughs> you know, in the office with something remote. And there, there's a lot of software innovation happening around that concept. And companies are going to buy a lot, of, I think, buy a lot of software to, to try to solve that problem. I think it's a really interesting point because, you know, if you look at like occupiers of real estate, like tenants, there's just an occupancy cost, which is like what percent of your revenue do you pay to be in the space that you're in? And today, it's almost like solutions and tools that we never thought of as being in competition with physical space are actually capturing some of it. And by the way, this meeting is an example, right? So like, if I wanted to record this with you as little as six months ago, I would have flown out to you, got a hotel, flown back. I mean, there, there's a lot more cost that Zoom just basically captured for both of us, or probably Zoom and Apple or whatever computer you're using, like captured. And it's like a reallocation from physical space to digital space. And I totally agree. Like, there's going to be these opportunities to build culture, do all the things that we would do in physical space in virtual space. And it's probably so early that we don't even know the, the forms, the incarnations that will take. Like what does yeah. a employee happy hour look like? Well, yeah. it probably doesn't look like what we're doing today, which is everyone logs into Zoom and drinks a drink. There's probably right. a way to make that better and more culturally resonant. Some of that's coming in education too. I mean, you know, my kids are in um, 10th grade, 6th grade, and 4th grade, and schools are struggling with all the same stuff, right? How do yeah. we... How do we virtually build friendships and all that, um, you know, online? And so, like, for example, um, there's a thing uh, called a Kahoot, 
which they do in my kid's school. And I don't know if that's a startup or, or, or what, but a Kahoot is basically, um, it's like a trivia game that you play online. So um, imagine all the kids, you know, their, their little faces are all there in, in Zoom. And, you know, first question pops up and it's some trivia, like get to know each other, you know, whatever, which right. kid has the first birthday of the year or whatever. And everyone like answers it in real time, like in the software. And there's like a leaderboard and then they're kind of like stickers to designate like who's winning and who's not. And like, you know, there's like a clock that they all see as the, it, anyway. And it's like a fun happy hour, you know, right. I'll call it that, but it's a happy hour game, you know, for kids to get to know, to know each other. And, you know, some startup out there is killing it with this idea that it's, you know, it's just, it's cool to see this type of innovation, try to fill the gap of, of what we can't do in person. Yeah, and, and I'm sure in universities too, right? Everything yeah, from yeah, clubs yeah. or fraternities or sororities, they're having to virtualize. And a lot of that is physical space that's going away, right? Like, yeah, and yeah. it's weird to conceptualize. And it, we've been saying this for a while that like tech, tech is not just like literally colliding with real estate in the sense that there's stuff you can deploy at the asset, but it's actually taking market share, right? Like if real estate owners don't adapt their space, they're actually losing market share to really not intuitive solutions. Like the one we're both on right now, Zoom, right? Like nobody thought of that as a real estate competitor, but we all just realized it is a massive real estate competitor. Um, yeah. And it's really big and it has super high margins. So yeah. Yeah. Um, it's amazing. I mean, what I find most amazing about Zoom is, you know, here's a technology that is really 10 years old uh, video conferencing. I mean, there was WebEx and, you know, there was a whole first generation of innovation in this space and then Apple gave it away with FaceTime and yeah. like still a startup was able to come along and create 50 plus billion of market cap, you know, just really just from a better UI uh, is yeah. what I would argue. Like it just made it a little bit easier, not even a lot easier, just a little bit easier than WebEx. Yeah. Um, and, you know, good for them. Um, yeah, I wonder what other categories that's still available in. It's, it's, it's pretty amazing. And it's like right now, if you asked me, hey, how much rent does, you know, my company pay in a given month? I know that number. Um, if you ask me how much do I spend as a company on Zoom, I have no idea. My, <laughs> guess, is, my guess is in two years, I will know that number. <laughs> right, right, right. A very important number. Um, yeah. And the infrastructure around it. Um, it it's, it's a bit like cloud. It's, it's kind of like AWS. Like I remember when, when Zillow first moved from on-prem to, you know, we started moving some of our stuff to the cloud. And then, yeah. it, you know, and then, and then, you know, I knew, I knew when we, when our CTO got invited to speak at an early AWS conference that it probably meant we were spending too much money on AWS. <laughs> <laughs> and, then, and then like in year five, All expenses paid trip. I started asking like, how much are we spending? And then by year like eight, it was a ginormous number. Like one of the biggest numbers in our whole, you know, expense base. And I'm like, well, how did that happen? Like, <laughs> right. right. Well, Spencer, this has been awesome. It's always so interesting getting your perspective on all this. And I'm excited to learn about a lot of the projects that I know you're working on in the real estate space. So hopefully we'll do it again. Thank you. This was fun. Thanks for having me. Awesome. Thanks, Spencer.